And I have been thinking, honey, that maybe this is your bottom. Bridesmaids is a story about what it means to hit bottom. We usually only hear about drug and alcohol addicts hitting their bottom, but Annie Walker proves this is something we all do at some point in our lives. I can't get off the couch. I got fired from my job. I got kicked out of my apartment. Because we are all addicts in one way or another. We're all addicts, Fiona. Just trying to fill a void. Some of us are just better at hiding it. As Annie sabotages her life and her best friend's wedding festivities, she feels powerless to stop the cycle of self-destruction that springs from an inner void she doesn't understand. Please, I'm just, I don't know what's going on with me right now. But after she reaches her lowest point, she at last turns her life around. And there's a deeply inspiring message in this film that director Paul Feig termed a nervous breakdown movie you can make the choice to break your toxic habits and fight for your happiness. Yes, you better learn to fight, because life will fight. Yeah. Life is gonna end life and I'm gonna bite you in the ass. Here's our take on how Annie teaches us to embrace the gift of arriving at rock bottom. Because you're your problem, Annie, and you're also your solution. This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is a learning platform where you can check out courses on everything, from 101s of event planning to shooting and editing Instagram-worthy photos. Skillshare offers thousands of online courses to fuel your creativity and career. And right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. So click the link in the description below to sign up now. a portrait of an addict. She may not be struggling with substance abuse, but she's watching her life spin out of control due to a pattern of compulsive, self-destructive behavior. Look at how she acts. She makes messy public scenes. Let's have some nice hot, unsanitary chocolate! She doesn't take responsibility for her actions, but pins the blame on others. It's all her fault, it is not mine! She refuses to acknowledge that she has a problem. Well, I'm fine. No. You're not fine. You're not fine, Annie. And she resists help because she doesn't want to give up her addiction. I don't need you to fix me. Or to fix you? I don't need any help. What then is Annie addicted to? Essentially, to feeling bad about herself. Lillian diagnoses this near the start when talking about Annie's casual relationship with the worst guy ever, Ted. You hate yourself after you see him every time. And then we go through this and you feel like shit. And it's almost like you're doing it because you feel bad about yourself. Annie keeps going back to the proverbial bottle, which in her case is a man who insults her and shows a cavalier disregard for her feelings. Oh, this is so awkward. I really want you to leave, but I don't know how to say it without sounding like a dick. Oh. Later, when she meets someone who is caring and genuinely interested, she pushes him away. He was really sweet and nice and cute. So naturally I ran out as fast as I could. What's wrong with me? So at this point, Annie doesn't want to feel better. She revels in her problems because they confirm her low self-esteem is warranted. I can't pay any of my bills. My car is a piece of shit. Uh, I don't have any friends. As we talked about, her antagonist Helen is the superficial image of the ideal woman, specifically designed to make Annie feel bad. It's unique, it's special, it's couture, this is made in oh France. Oh, this is, um, this is $800. I'm kidding. It's on sale. But the reason Helen gets so deep under her skin is that Annie wants to indulge her feelings of inadequacy. When she spars with a young customer at the jewelry store, she seems to intentionally provoke the girl into saying the worst about her. Well, you're an old, single loser who's never gonna have any friends. And we gather from Annie's extreme reaction to this dig, you're a little that the girl has hit on exactly the negative self-talk that's always going on in Annie's head as she compares herself to the Helens of the world. Maybe she'll find a new best friend, and maybe she'll be more successful than you are, and prettier, and richer, and skinnier. The movie cleverly plants this theme of the universal inner addict through Annie's mom. I signed up to speak at AA tonight. I keep telling you, you're not supposed to go to those things, you know, you're not an alcoholic. There's a deeper point in her comment. Only because I've never had a drink. On some level, all of us contain the potential for addictive behavior. Annie's mom feels she benefits from AA meetings because they manage her tendency to spiral into obsessive thinking. I go to those meetings because I can obsess. Annie's addiction to feeling bad is encapsulated in her refusal to do the thing that she loves, baking. You're so good at it. 
Oh well, let's change the subject. No more baking. Significantly, right after she meets this guy who likes the real her, we see her inspired to bake for the first time in the film, like his presence reminds her of her true passion. But facing this exceptional talent which she's wasting just makes Annie feel down. The scars left by her failed bakery and the boyfriend who left her as a result are still raw. He was my boyfriend, and then he left me when the business went under. So anyway. And she's not ready to reopen to this positive and powerful source of happiness within her. Not doing what she loves is a self-imposed punishment. It's as if her defeatist thinking has convinced her she doesn't deserve to bake anymore. You know what you should be doing? Setting up a new bakery. No, I'm kind of done with that. What? I don't do it anymore. Significantly, it's when Rhodes actively tries to enable her to bake. I popped out and I got a few little... Bacon bits and pieces, butter, milk, because I thought that it would be fun for us to bake together today. That she turns on him. I don't know what you're getting so upset about. Because you don't know me. She's not just rejecting him, she's rejecting herself. She prefers a man who will also reject her and prove her unworthiness. You know what, it's getting really late. You should probably go. I'm gonna miss you so much. If Annie's addiction is unhappiness, her biggest hurdle is that she's seeing only negatives. You're just focusing on this little bad thing as if it were the end of the world. You have to stop that. When you're suffering, there can be a perverse satisfaction in wallowing in self-pity or self-loathing. You know, I go on. You have to go on, you know? And I don't see that. I see mopey girl. I see sad girl. As bad as Annie's life may seem, there are good things in it, like her supportive mom and a best friend who thinks the world of her. Yay, Annie! <laughs> These are not insignificant blessings. As we come to see, Helen, who appears to have it all, is actually envious of Annie. I don't have any female friends. <laughs> But Annie always chooses to overlook silver linings and fixate on the dark cloud. Here's a friend standing directly in front of you trying to talk to you, and you choose to talk about the fact that you don't have any friends. She projects her unhappiness onto the external world, seeing anything good as immediately suspect or temporary. You guys love each other, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. That will go away. <laughs> oh, and get our necklace says best friends forever. Forever? Forever. I don't think you guys will be best friends forever, no offense. And she puts up walls against things that could improve her life. I know how guys act. One minute it means something, the next minute it doesn't. Oh, right, yeah, you've got it all figured out. Yeah. yeah. From the outside, this is easy to see, but Annie is blind to these patterns until she hits bottom. The idea that you need to reach your lowest point before starting recovery is a key part of the Alcoholics Anonymous ethos. I'm telling you, hitting bottom is a good thing because, because, because. there's nowhere to go but up, yep. right? The book 12 Steps and 12 Traditions argues, few people will sincerely try to practice the AA program unless they have hit bottom. In both addiction and matters of personal happiness, so often we do have to be pushed to a breaking point before we get honest about our inner demons. Annie talks about hitting her bottom at the point after she's rejected Rhodes. Since you're not returning any of my calls, I assume that you're not interested in spending any more time with me, which is fine. So don't worry, I won't be bothering you ever again. Is fired from her job, kicked out of her apartment. We'd like to invite you to no longer live with us anymore. And returns to live with her mom. Remember when you thought I hit bottom? That wasn't bottom. But even then, she's not quite there yet. There's still her public meltdown at the shower at Helen's house. Ooh, delicious stupid cookie, I think I'll... And if you're gonna act like this, then don't even bother coming to my wedding! This is the real bottom, truly being faced with the loss of the friend who's always been the best thing in her life. The irony is that, even though this is Annie's greatest fear, she's also been unconsciously pushing for this outcome through her actions. Because her addiction to self-punishment will not be satisfied until it has swallowed up everything good. I won't bother you anymore! As soon as she hits this bottom, though, immediately things start changing. Annie is suddenly able to listen to the messages the universe sends her. Rhodes confronts her about how much she hurt him. Your problem, Annie, is that you just don't understand that you can hurt people! with these broken lights. 
His comment underlines the way that addicts believe their addiction is only about them, but their behavior makes the people they love suffer. Right after this revelation, Annie displays a turning point in her actions. After having called Ted for a ride, What's up, buddy? Call for some roadside assistance? Come on! She's finally not okay with staying in a situation that makes her miserable. She's bold and proactive. Please pull over. Why? Because I would rather get murdered out here than spend the next half an hour with you. Can you please, can you please just pull over? Next, after a quick fix of wallowing in the sadness of watching Tom Hanks lose Wilson in Castaway, She's visited by Megan, who drives home the same lesson. Annie has to take control. I'm trying to get you to fight for your shitty life, and you won't do it. You just won't Stop do it. it. Megan embodies a unique spirituality. I met a dolphin down there, and I swear to God, that dolphin looked not at me, but into my soul, into my goddamn soul, Annie. So you could say the life-changing visit she pays Annie mirrors the way Bill Wilson was motivated to found AA after he saw a white light and felt the presence of God. Just as AA is deeply informed by religion, there are 12 steps because of the 12 apostles. Megan's inspiring pep talk becomes the foundation on which Annie rebuilds her life. Now you gotta stop feeling sorry for yourself because I do not associate with people that blame the world for their problems." Annie's story underscores AA's central lesson of accountability and taking responsibility for your actions. You destroyed that party single-handedly, and you know it. You know, you have to take responsibility for what you've done. One of the 12 steps is continuing to take personal inventory and promptly admitting when you're wrong. Annie does this when she owns how she let her friend down by not supporting her in this crucial time. This has been really hard to do without you. No, it's my fault. I think I'm the one with the, the mental problems. <laughs> She acts out another famous step in the 12 steps, making amends, when she bakes Rhodes an apology cake. The serenity prayer, which is often recited in AA meetings, goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. For most of the movie, Annie isn't doing the second part, changing what she can. Nope. I don't think you want any help. That's I think you want to have a little pity party. Oh. Yeah, I think Annie wants a little pity party. This point is driven home by the symbolism of her faltering car. Annie needs to learn to be the driver of her life and stop acting like a helpless passenger. But she's been letting her car deteriorate thanks to her inaction. Do you have any idea how frustrating it is to see you night by night drive past me with your tail light still broken? When there's an incredibly simple fix right in front of her. Helen, just- Oh, don't. This didn't happen because of Helen. This happened because you didn't get your taillights fixed. It's pretty simple. All this shows that Annie also lacks the serenity prayer's wisdom to know the difference between what we can and can't control. She fixates on the things that are out of reach and unattainable. He's so hot, though. Look, I know you say he's cute and all that stuff, but it makes you feel like shit, you know? So she has to learn to let those things go, pay attention to what she can do for herself, and woman up. I'm glad to see you got a little bit of spark in you. I knew that Annie was in there somewhere. Still, she has to break down first before she can rebuild. And this is okay. Annie's disintegration is so satisfying to watch because it purges the emotions our society largely encourages us to ignore, bottle up, and deny. Why can't you just be happy for me and then go home and talk behind my back later like a normal person? Most of the time, we're expected to put on a happy face and keep up appearances when we're not okay inside. You're selling lifelong happiness. You're not telling everyone about your problems and how your boyfriend left you and maybe marriage will work out. But like Annie, we need to confront when things are wrong in our lives before we have any hope of making them better. Okay, mom, enough for the AA no, stuff. Not, it's not AA stuff, it's life. Annie's story disproves the false narrative that things automatically get better as you get older. You read my journal? At first, I did not know that it was your diary. I thought it was a very sad, handwritten book. We hear talk about the quarter-life crisis. You know I'm gonna be 25 in June. You are? That's a quarter of a century. Makes a girl think. But in her 30s, Annie exemplifies the third life crisis. 
She's in her 30s where she's probably very ambitious in her 20s to start her own business. And then when that didn't work out, she sort of falls into that place where a lot of people, I think, find themselves. Her breakdown comes at a time when the expectation is that you've overcome the chaos of your 20s and have arrived at a settled, well-adjusted place. Her best friend Lillian is right on schedule with what society expects women of their age to be doing. Ever since you got engaged, everything's turned to shit! Lillian's big announcement is the trigger that sends Annie into an existential tailspin. Oh my god! <laughs> what is happening? It forces Annie to come to terms with all the ways her own life isn't what she thought it would be. I feel like her life is going off and getting perfect and mine's just like... Annie embodies how the third life crisis feels more serious, high stakes, and lonely than what you might go through in your 20s, as time no longer seems so unlimited. This is my husband. You don't have a husband. In its time, Bridesmaids was called the female version of The Hangover. I'm so excited. Helen just called. She said we can go to Vegas. While Bridesmaids holds up a lot better over time, these 2009 and 2011 movies about pre-wedding festivities both feature not a soon-to-be bride or groom who's panicking, but their friends. Annie and the guys in The Hangover act out in wild ways under the subconscious burden of their friend transitioning into a new, more adult phase of life. Although it may not be deliberate, Annie sabotages all of Lillian's bridesmaid events. You have managed to ruin every event in my wedding. Thank you very much. Reflecting just how much the prospect of this wedding bothers her, even if she doesn't fully realize it. Oh my god, I just got hot. You did? Yes. Are you okay? Yeah, my pits are sweating. What does that mean? Hurts. I don't know, I'm hot. Bridesmaids and The Hangover struck a chord with audiences because they'd acknowledged how giving away a friend to marriage can feel like a loss that must be grieved. Everything's gonna change. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna get to live five minutes away from you. And it makes me so sad. Annie is also a product of her era. Well, I'm the genius that opened a bakery during the recession. Three years after the financial crisis of 2008, she reflected the struggles of young people in recession-era America. Just because you didn't make any money at it doesn't mean that you failed at it. Lost a lot of money. All my money. Is it any wonder that during Annie's plane meltdown, she harks back to a simpler time? This is the 90s. Right. It's not. You're, you're in the wrong decade. You are. By the end of the movie, Annie has mended fences with Lillian, and she's gotten together with Rhodes. So things are on the upswing. Hey, how did everything go? Oh. Strangely well. But the movie isn't about her suddenly becoming a huge runaway success. It's about the smaller, harder changes she makes to be happier, and how those actually are a big deal. And besides, you need to blaze the trail for me, and then report back and tell me what's coming. Even if you're not hooked on feeling bad about yourself, there are endless addictive thought patterns you could be engaging in. Whether it's being envied, numbing yourself to escape a grueling day-to-day -day existence, or obsessing over someone who hurt you. But They've been you married know, 12 that's years. Oh, okay, but she's still a whore. Yeah. So whatever unhealthy behavior might be going on in your head, ask yourself, is it time to get clean? You know, I don't think it's ever too late. I really don't. In the immortal words of Wilson Phillips, No one can change your life except for you. But if you're not quite ready to take that first step, you can do as Annie does. Just listen to the music and hold on. Things are going away if you hold on for one more day. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community we love. With thousands of classes taught by seasoned pros, Skillshare has a class on pretty much anything you could want. You can develop your creativity through a class on calligraphy, graphic design, or writing. You can learn to succeed in business with classes on how to make it as a freelancer, market a podcast, or become an Instagram influencer. Or you can bring that extra flair into your lifestyle, sharpen your knife skills, learn paper making, speak Spanish, or channel your inner bridesmaid by learning how to arrange a stunning centerpiece with Michael and Derek Putnam, who run the boutique floral design company Putnam & Putnam. Right now, Skillshare is offering our viewers two months access to all their classes for free. Just click the link in the description below to check it out today.